Good evening, everyone. We are continuing with our essence of the Bhagavad Gita, Swamiji's absolutely spectacular commentary based on um, his uh, superconscious memory of Master's manuscript and the time Swamiji spent with Master when he was writing the commentary. So even though this is authored and edited by Swami Kriyananda, the teachings are entirely how Master explained the Gita. So let's start now with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, dear friend and guide Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to all. Help us to attune our energy to your living presence within, that everything we do will be an expression of your infinite love. Help us to be your servants, your channels in this world. There is so much need for divine understanding. Bless us that we may speak with your voice and with your heart. Om. Peace. Amen. So we are working. We are now at the end of the last few verses of chapter 6 of the Bhagavad Gita. And we are almost exactly halfway through Swami's Book of Commentary, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of this course, which are up to 75 classes. It'll be probably solidly 150 before we're finished. I think I've mentioned to you that I've, I, I did the whole Gita many years ago. It's an audio recording that's available through Ananda Palo Alto. You can find it. You might be able to find it through my website, too. But I, I, set, a, I set a schedule. I did 10 pages every night. And so it still took quite a few classes. But it was just way, way, way too much material. I didn't feel like I could do justice to it. And then I started doing what I'm doing now, which is an open-ended class. But if I'm not mistaken, we were doing it for India... On, the, on a webinar, but in order for it to be a convenient evening time for them, it was an early morning time for us. And after a while, it just didn't, it wasn't working for them and it didn't work for me. So now I'm really eager, however many more months it might take me, to just go verse by verse and uh, see what every verse has to say. I'm doing it as much, you have to understand, Obviously, I hope that over time this will prove useful. It's not the kind of course where you can sort of, I mean, it's a lot. It's a big commitment, but then so is this book. Um, so I'm, my hope is that over time, because these things that we do for the Internet have a, a very long shelf life. Basically, they have an evergreen shelf life. So I just had the wish, you know, over the course of the next it may even take another couple of years because I'm going to be interrupted as I have, was interrupted in the last month. All of this came out of being quarantined with COVID and now that COVID is letting us out of our homes a little more and even out of our countries a little more, um, I'll, I won't be as steady as I have been. But I will be for the next couple of months. But I just, um, and as anyway, I'm just trying to say, I'm just trying to create this. So we'll continue. So, chapter 6, verse 44. And we've been talking about what happens um, from incarnation to incarnation with yoga practice if we don't become self realized. The power of former yoga practice, meaning in a previous lifetime, is sufficient to impel, as it were, the reborn yogi on his upward path. Even one who seeks only a theoretical understanding of yoga is more highly advanced 
than one who is dedicated to outward scriptural Vedic rites. What we're talking about here is when Master and Krishna talk about yoga, they're talking about um, practice according to specific techniques that actually influence the energy. And Vedic rituals, um, rituals of all kinds, um, have a capacity to transform our consciousness. Swami Kriyananda himself created a ritual in the Festival of Light, which he did in the about 1986 is when he did it. So Ananda had been in existence for about 20 years before he gave us any kind of a ritual. I think he wanted to keep the energy freer and let us sort of experiment and then see how it should crystallize. But he spoke strongly about the beneficial power of, of some simple ritual. And he said, Master also believed in, in a few simple rituals. But the problem is what happens in the human mind is that we begin to think that the power is in the ritual itself, whereas the power is really in our consciousness. And a ritual, if it's entered into with sufficient um, concentration and devotion, can catalyze a change of energy. But what creates the change of energy is our attunement and our concentration. So it's not like you can just um, uh, pay someone to do it and have it work like, uh, like magic. It, it just doesn't work like magic. So he's saying here, um, even one who seeks only a theoretical understanding of yoga, meaning a theoretical understanding of how the energy works within the human consciousness <clears throat> and how we can interiorize, intensify, and elevate that energy. That's what, that's what we're trying to do. See, we have this life force and this consciousness is flowing through us all the time. But we tend to just have it come in and we just dissipate it. We don't concentrate it. We, we um, let it drain out from us. We don't hold it um, in a conscious way in the, in the origin point of our own being. I mean, we see this is how ordinary people live. This is how most people live. Most people live, they just spend their energy every day. They're not building anything. They're not building um, an, any inner realities. They're just spending their energy every day. But even if you become interested in the theoretical aspects of how energy can be focused and made dynamic and where magnetism comes from, I, a, a lot of people in, in my uh, generational group who became interested in spiritual things and it's, it's still common today because it's the way the natural cycle works. Sometimes it begins with diet. And it's certainly for myself and a lot of my, um, what would you say, cohort. Um, I remember in the mid to late 60s, just sort of all these ideas about vegetarianism and organic foods and non-processed foods and just this idea that what we eat eight would affect the way we felt and the way we lived, how we felt inside our bodies and also even the quality of our, of our mental energy. And so I remember when I began to sort of shift over, which I did at a very young age, 18 or 19 years old, I became exceedingly focused on, on uh, the physical well-being based on diet and breath and water and uh, uh, to a certain extent exercise, uh, yoga postures, of course. But what I discovered was that by deliberate action, I could change my inner reality. And it started with that physical, but what it, what it was, was by deliberate, carefully chosen action, my, my inner consciousness is also shifted. Now, at the time, and even to this day, that theory, that's the theoretical premise, 
is that my consciousness is under my control and is influenced and directed by the choices that I make. And of course, we go much farther than that. We go into meditation and spiritual practice and affirmations and prayer and the grace of God and all these things, which was starting. I've, I've never been dedicated to the yoga postures beyond my first few years. I just, it, was, it just never captured my imagination. I learned master's energization exercises and have been faithful to that practice. But yoga postures, I only did for the first few years that I was involved, and almost not at all once I arrived at the ashram. But the way Swamiji taught the yoga postures, it also included an affirmation. And that was a very, it still is, it's a very, uh, it's a unique and creative uh, addition to a very ancient tradition. So, so you put your body into a particular position, which you see was relatively easy to do. I don't mean it was easy to, to assume the more challenging postures, but we all know we have access to our bodies. We don't tend to have access to our minds in quite the same way. The mind tends to move on its own, but I can pick up my hand and I can place it here. I can pick up my other hand and put it here. So it, when Swamiji presented in his book, um, at that time it was called The 14 Steps to Perfect Joy, but now it's the same materials called The Art and Science of Raja Yoga. And he would t teach the yoga postures, which was, I, it, they were beginning to come in in America, but I learned them from Swamiji. There were other Swamis teaching, but he was the one I learned from. And you put your hands and your body in, in a certain position, which was, which was at least you could uh, get a, a facsimile of that position, something that you could go in the direction of that position. But then you would concentrate your attention at the point between the eyebrows and you would repeat an affirmation, energy and joy um, floods my body cells, joy descends to me. And so one would begin to understand the theoretical basis of yoga, which is that I can do something deliberately, and, it, and it's not hard to repeat that affirmation. Of course, the hard part is to repeat that affirmation to the exclusion of all the other distracting ideas that come in. That's where the challenge comes in. But again, we, one has access to words. One can repeat words in one's mind. It's not at the beginning stage is hard to do. But what it opened me up to on a, 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 an absolutely cataclysmically transforming way was that I could take charge of my own inner consciousness. And I also began to understand at the same time that my inner consciousness was everything. If what, what my inner consciousness was, was my reality. It, it, it didn't make any difference what was going on around me. If I was depressed, I would be depressed. If I was angry, I would be angry. If I was afraid, I would be afraid. External conditions might, um, my, my, res my inner response might be activated by external conditions, but it was my inner response that determined how I experienced things. And that was like, that was the beginning. That's the theoretical practice of yoga, which is inner consciousness is everything, and you can influence your inner consciousness by, well, by everything, by the thoughts you think, by the foods you eat, by the way you use and hold your body, by the company you keep, by the music you listen to, it goes on and on and on. Now the alternative to that, which is described here, which is to out, those who are dedicated to outward scriptural rites and rituals, this is the belief <clears throat> that spirituality is defined by how you behave in an outward way. This is, in a very real sense, religion. And Hinduism, um, when, when Master incarnated in 1893, and was sent to this world by the great Himalayan masters, Babaji and the other masters, his assignment was to teach the original teachings of Jesus, which in the West we think about more, 
but he also came to teach the original teachings of Krishna. Now, Jesus is considered is the founding avatar for what has become Christianity and all of the iterations of Catholic and Protestant churches that exist in the world all began with the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Over countless millennia, Hinduism has seen many avatars, but the, the center point to a very large extent of Hinduism is Lord Krishna. And so Master came with the assignment that he was to teach the original teachings of Krishna and the original teachings of Jesus and to show that they were the same. And that even though Christianity has gone in this direction and Hinduism has gone in this direction, if you trace them back to their origin point, we discover, as Master put it, the unifying principle of self-realization. But Hinduism, well, when I, um, I was raised Jewish, so I never had any Christian experience, but fortunately I grew up without any prejudice, so I was, it was very easy for me to accept Master's actually very radical expression of Christianity, and I was conscious enough to realize how radical it was compared to the fundamentalists or the Catholics. So I was, it was easy for me to accept it, but I knew nothing about Hinduism. At that point, which was starting in 1969, we weren't working with the globalization that has come since. So I didn't know anything about Hinduism except the most sort of superficial. And I thought what Swamiji was teaching us and what, what he had learned from Master was Hinduism. Because after all, Master was from India. So I just assumed that. It was 1986 um, when I went to India for the first time and went on a pilgrimage trip and sort of saw Hindu rituals, saw the pujas that were carried out and the way the temples were done and met, met the priests and saw some of the holidays and all of the things that happened there. And I realized <clears throat> that what Master taught was just about as Hindu as it was Catholic, which is to say, not very, not very at all. That Hinduism was one thing, Catholicism was another. And what both have in common is an enormous amount of outward ritual. In Christianity, the rituals are simpler. I mean, there's, there's fewer of them. Hinduism has, has so much time to lay over all these different ways of doing things. But especially in the Catholic tradition, they have these things that you have to do. And this is what makes you a Catholic. You go to confession, you go to Mass, you follow certain other things, and they're all defined, clearly defined. <clears throat> you can look at it, you can see whether you've, got, whether you've come or not. The Baptists have there, you have to be baptized in a certain way, you have to refrain from doing certain things, you have to hold to these certain beliefs and ways of behavior. I mean, and so it's defined, and it's defined outward. Now, of course, the purpose of those outward activities is to shift the inner energy. But over time, what happens is the outward activity itself becomes the definition of your religion. My friend, the, the, who was our tour guide for the many years that I traveled to India um, leading these pilgrimage groups, um, he, he was the first Indian person that I got to know personally and you know, just the way he lived. He lived in New Delhi. He's a very uh, modern man and very um, east and west in his thinking. Very, a wonderful man. And, but we had so much fun sort of learning about things. He, he bought a, a, a flat, an apartment. <coughs> and um, first there was just the financial system, which he had to pay for it completely before he could move in, which was just, that was just, economics, that's social custom. But then when he finally had paid for the whole thing, in order to move into it, he had to consult an astrologer who gave him the auspicious day. And the auspicious move-in day was five months after he had paid for it. And then before he could move in, he had to invite the pujaris, the priests, 
in to do all these rituals that were completely necessary in order for the, the in order for the gods to be pleased is actually how you would put it. And when we sort of commented on it, he he just said it was unthinkable in his culture that he would move into a new apartment without having the priests come in and do the proper rituals first. The rituals were simply the definition of how things were done. There was a ritual for his wife and how she had to come into the house and all of these different things. And what was what amused us so much, which made it even more ironic, that part of the ritual involved that they had a, a, a fire, a fire ceremony. So they brought in a, whatever they needed to be the fire bowl, and they lit a fire right there in the living room, which of course smoked up the walls. And then part of the auspicious ritual is that you break coconuts for good luck. I was in, I've been involved in things since where you throw the coconuts on the ground, you smash them, which of course coconuts have um, milk in them, coconut milk in them. So that splatters all over the place. So by the time the Pujaris had finished the ritual, he had to clean and repaint some of the main rooms. But it was, again, unthinkable that he would not do it. This was just the way it had to be done. And so what Krishna is beginning to tell us, because even at the time that this happened, we have to understand the difference between outward ritual and actual inner transformation. They can work together. But alas, too often they don't. People are just much more willing to hire the pujari to do the necessary rituals, or to, it used to be to, you know, pay indulgences to the Catholic Church or whatever it might be, in the hope that that outward action will bring inner transformation. Now, if it's done with the right attitude, it's not that it has nothing to offer, but even the theoretical practice of yoga Master says, we'll bring you more. So, um, the other part I love here is the power of former yoga practice is sufficient to impel the reborn yogi on his upward path. Many of us who were the founding members of Ananda, which was a, a particular tribe, many of us arrived in the early 70s and many of us were exactly the same age within six months or a year of each other. We were uh, definitely a karmic group that came to do a certain job together. We incarnated precisely to do it. We were, we were almost without exception, that founding group was all um, Americans, Westerners, with no particular ties or connection to outward connection to the traditions of India, but who on some level when it was presented to us, just like Swami Kriyananda. Swami Kriyananda picked up Autobiography of a Yogi, and he just recognized Master. And he, he tells the story himself, both in his own autobiography and many, many times in, in talks that he's given, about how just Master called him, called him to buy that book. And as soon as he had the book in his hands, he met, he was in the bookstore and he met uh, an old school friend, and that friend was talking to Swamiji about all the worldly success he was going to have, and the house he was going to have, and the money he was going to have, and all of this. And Swamiji said the more that man talked about the worldly success he was questing after, and Swami said the more he hugged Master's book to his heart. And he said in some strange way, this old friend of his was a stranger, and Master was the old friend because they just understood each other. And Swami also said something really fascinating. He said it many years later. He read Autobiography of a Yogi just continuously for the next several days, just from cover to cover, and that's all that he did, basically. And then uh, after one day, he, he was in New York City, and he got on a bus, and he crossed the whole of the United States and went to Los Angeles, where Master had an ashram, and was was still living at that time. This was 1948. Master lived four more years. So Swamiji went and lived with Master for, for that period of time until Master left his body. Now, just a moment here, let me find it. Oh, yes. But Swamiji said, he, he often talked about how powerful that book was. And one time he put it this way. He said, I always felt from from 
childhood, from birth, I always felt that I live, that I, I inhabited a world of my own. That's what Swamiji said. That the way he experienced the world, the thoughts he had, the values he shared, the feelings, he felt that he was alone in that experience. He had a very fine family. He had a privileged upbringing. But, but the real, what was real and important to Swamiji, even the vibration in which he thought, in which he lived, no one shared it. And of course, that is, is, is difficult because one naturally wants to belong to the world around. One wants to follow in one's father's footsteps to be, uh, have companions. It, that's only natural. But Swamiji said he felt he lived in a world uh, he lived alone in his own world, even though he, he had friends, he was popular, he had his family, all of this. He said when he read Autobiography of a Yogi, he realized that he and Master inhabited the same world. I mean, just imagine, I mean, many different ways of, of expressing the impact of reading that book, what it had on Swamiji. I also was had the very very good karma. Um, I I don't think I was as conscious as Swamiji, and certainly the world I inhabited was not as elevated as the world Swami inhabited. But I always felt, as I'm sure many others have felt, that I could never quite figure out where I was going to find my place in this world, and it was a matter of some concern to me. Um, I had some desires, especially for human relationships. I had a longing to be a mother and to raise children at that time. But the world just, it just didn't make sense to me and I couldn't quite figure out what they were all doing. <laughs> That's the only way I can say it. I just couldn't quite figure out what they were all doing. And I, I found self-realization a couple of years before I met Swamiji. But when I met Swamiji, it was like he made sense to me. And oddly, the odd thing about that was I hadn't heard him speak when I made that decision. His vibration, I recognized his vibration. That's the only thing I can say. And, you know, it would have seemed uh, a bit wacky to have made such a fast decision and such a profound one, except that in 50 years I've never wavered. So apparently there was something real about it. But it was a recognition. And I was in a position, I had committed myself to almost nothing in this world. And I was in a position where I could just follow whatever I felt to follow. And finally, there was something I wanted to do. Many years later, which is to say just a few years ago, when I was... Um, Swami had asked me to travel in India and, and give, give classes on, on these teachings, which at first I felt quite presumptuous doing, but gradually I figured out that even though um, the, the people of India have, been, have had the great privilege of being raised with many of the things that are so profoundly important for human life and success, like discipleship and reincarnation and the law of karma and um, the return of the avatars, many, many things. And they have this wonderful, comprehensive knowledge of scripture, and, and many do, of scripture and story and epic and so on, um, which I've had to work assiduously for years to gain. But Master came also to, to teach the original teachings of Krishna. So I, I gradually learned that people in India, almost without exception, did not understand Master's new expression of self-realization. And therefore, I had something that I could offer. But in any case, I was there, and I was talking to, to a, a small group of people in Bangalore, and they didn't know me at all, so I was telling them a little about meeting Swami and how I came on the path. I was 22 when I met Swamiji, and I immediately set things in motion. It took me more than a year, actually, to extricate myself, because even though I wasn't committed to much in this world, there were people in my life that I couldn't quite leave behind, not my biological family, but friends and others, 
And I had to work my way through that before I could leave. But uh, when I told them at, at the age of 24, I just sold almost everything I had and I moved to the ashram and I never looked back. And they said, what did your parents think? <laughs> you know? And I said, I never asked them. And that was sort of like, and then I had to say, I'm an American, you have to understand. In the USA, we operate a little differently. I'd already left home. I was already on my own. I didn't owe them an explanation. In my culture, I didn't owe them an explanation. But there was another part to it, too. What diff it wouldn't have made any difference. Because the former practice of yoga impelled me to continue on the upward path. And w when, we, when we simply factor in reincarnation, a great deal that seems incomprehensible suddenly becomes perfectly sensible. And when, when one looks back over one's whole life and you realize that I was always the same. I didn't have the words for it until I was 19, but I had the understanding of it intuitively from the very beginning. All, it, I mean, I'm not, this is not saying that I'm a great saint or anything like that. It just says, this is not my first time. I was impelled. Not merely like, oh, this might be interesting. I was impelled to find this. I remember being very small. Um, I must have been two or three years old. My, my younger sister was not yet born. And my brother and I were in the back seat of the parents' car. My brother's older. My brother was a terrible tease. And somehow we managed to create some kind of a kerfuffle in the back seat of the car. And my mother turned from the front seat and scolded us very sternly and wholly deserved. It, there was no question about whether or not we were being naughty. Whatever we were doing, we were. But it hurt my feelings that she scolded me. I felt a little crushed by it. My mother was wonderful, so it's not like it was a bad thing. I wasn't being abused on any level. I was just a child. and I was a little petulant that my energy had been curtailed. And I remember crawling, getting down to the floor. There were, no, there were no restrained seats in those days. Getting down on the floor, putting my head on the floor of the car, and tuning in to the rhythm of the tires, which, which actually is kind of an ohm sound. Ohm, like that. I remember tuning into it, and, and this is my conscious recollection. I knew that if I tuned into the sound and, and went deep into myself, I would find a place where nothing upsetting in this world could touch me. And it wasn't like dissociating or anything like that. It was a memory. The, in, the, the yogi from previous lifetimes will be impelled to follow the upward path. I was there as a toddler trying to do what I came to understand was the purpose of my life, which was to live from the inside and by a conscious act of will and concentration influence my inner consciousness. If I could influence my inner consciousness, everything in life would be fine. Interesting, isn't it? Think about your own life. You may, more than you realize, have just known things and acted accordingly without any of the concepts in place. But having the essence. You see, rituals and so on have all these concepts in place. But the, the theory of yoga is that by a deliberate act of will and discipline, we can change our consciousness. And that's everything. So, let's see. So, all right. Now, chapter 6, verse 45. Diligently following his chosen path and cleansing himself thereby of all sin, karmic debts, as put in parentheses as an explanation of the word sin, the yogi, after many births, attains perfection and enters at last into the supreme beatitude. I love that phrase, karmic debts. I, I didn't know it for a long time, but 
when I finally really understood it, it it's it's it somehow helps me to be able to put into perspective what the whole law of karma is all about and what it is that we're doing. If you think about it that let me let me try to get this out would be you know a debt is something where you have you have obtained something but you haven't yet given the proper um, uh, energy back and if that energy we think of it as money I mean you can I can go out with my little credit cards and I can buy all this stuff and I just put it on my credit card but my bank account has not been changed until the bill comes due and then I have to transfer money money represents the accumulation of energy of life force spent in a certain way to build these resources if instead I skip town and I just get all that stuff and I never pay for it like every so often I'm sure you've had it happen too there was a period of time when I was traveling a lot and I did not yet have the magnetic protector for my uh, credit card and like about two or three times in one year my credit card was compromised because I realized people were getting those magnetic readers and then I put my cards inside some R um, RFD protected I think that's what it's called and it hasn't happened since I remember I was somewhere I think I was traveling in India and I for one reason I went to I went to a rather shady place I had to stay in this hotel that didn't really seem quite on the up and up to me and a couple of days later someone bought a ticket from Delhi to Brazil <laughs> and I'm not quite sure how I found out but I found out very quickly maybe the credit card company called me I don't know and I thought no I don't think that was mine so if that person actually had traveled to Brazil on my credit card he would have accrued, accrued a debt he should have paid for it it's a karmic debt he took something that didn't belong to or that he didn't he didn't give energy for what he got okay now let's take it out of the realm of money and think of it in terms of um, I, I want power and position and I'm going to get power and position not by lovingly winning your support but by exercising my willpower and forcing you to do what I want you to do so that I have power maybe even I have you know power in the world because I have maybe I've blackmailed people into doing things that I want or I want happiness and I happen to be born into a, let's say as an example a beautiful female body and I think that happiness will come to me if I have lots of men admiring me so I have lots of relationships and I'm not faithful in my relationships and I don't build anything deep I just use the the allure of my beautiful young body to sort of get all this attention and maybe get money and maybe get gifts and things like that and it's it, it it's not it's not um, it's not Dharma it's not acting in a way where the exchange is appropriate where the energy that I put out is consistent with the true intention of life which is to raise my consciousness to expand my awareness not merely to indulge my egoic desire to be admired my egoic desire for sensuality I've set up an imbalance we are born to realize God we are born to be perfect instruments in this world of divine understanding we are born to live um, a high-minded noble incarnation that serves the welfare of all that's what our task is if instead we we go for for cheap thrills <laughs> compared to divine bliss I'm not really mocking everything but we try to get happiness in a way that is not really the source of happiness we set up an imbalance and and we create karma for ourselves because karma is an unlearned lesson it's it's karma is the simple belief that something other than attunement with with the divine will bring me the fulfillment and happiness I seek 
And that doesn't mean that there's no fulfillment or no happiness from all the many things that this world has to offer. Human love can be very ennobling. We can, um, serving our family can be ex extremely expansive and, and help us to, to understand life on a higher and more expansive level. It's not that these things are evil in any way. But if we think that our final fulfillment lies not in attunement with God, but in getting this for myself, having this person love me, having this beautiful home, having this power, having this fame, having this talent, it's, it's a mistake. That's all. It's just a mistake. It looks like it's going to fulfill us um, on the deepest level for eternity. But we, as we have the experience, we gradually realize that no, it won't. And so each one of those things where we take happiness in a way that is not completely aligned with divine reality, we set up a karmic debt. That's what it is. We just, we owe the universe something balancing. We have to learn to transcend it. And if we've been, you know, very ignorant, if we have abused people, if we have taken what didn't belong to us, if we have been ungrateful for the gifts that were given to us, we, 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 the debt concept is really more clear. This is some kind of a debt. This is just something that I have to do. I have to pay back the universe for my wrong attitude at some point earlier. I just, I had a wrong attitude. My wrong attitude set up an energetic debt that I need now to balance. So you can call it sin, you can call it ignorance, you can call it error, or you can call it, you can call it karma, but karmic debt is the one that works for me. Why is this happening to me? Why am I not being successful? Why are these people mad at me? Why can't I bring to myself what I want? It's because I have a karmic debt I have to pay off first. I have to become centered in God no matter what. I have to recognize that my fulfillment comes first from the divine. I have to pay back the wrong thoughts. I have to balance the wrong thoughts that I've had. Swamiji commented that in, in, in past lives, Master told him that in past lives, he, he was eaten up with doubts, is how Master put it to him. He had many, many doubts on the spiritual path. And implied in that is that sometimes he, um, he, he, the, 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 he, he led others to, to also have doubts. So Swami said one of the reasons he's, he's had to do so much teaching is because he, he created a karmic debt, because he spread... Uh, he spread doubt. Now he has to pay that debt back by spreading faith. I was told once by a psychic. I don't. I don't know. This 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 woman has proven herself to be very capable of truthfully perceiving karmic patterns in past lives. I'm not going to say that this is true, but it, it's apocryphal. I have a lot of past life. I would call them intuitions where I just sort of have a feeling about how, you know, what, what, what might have happened. I, I wouldn't say for sure that any of them are true, but, but many of them are apocryphal. They describe a situation that, that explains the energy in the present. If this actually happened, the energy in the present is explained. Conflicts that I might have, or positive attractions, or an unexpected developments. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to put this between truth and fiction in my own mind because intuitions will come to me, but they're not like big revelations of past lives. It's just that it makes so much sense. I just accept it as, as apocryphal. If not actually true, it, it explains the energy. So now let me think where I was. Give me a moment here. Oh, yes. The psychic woman told me, quote, that I helped start the French Revolution <laughs> because I have this capacity to use words and I can be a bit of a firebrand. I actually read recently, and I'm not going to claim that this is who I was, but very recently I read um, about a woman 
who actually did help start the French Revolution. And as soon as she saw where it was really going, she profoundly repudiated what she had embraced and did her bet, best to try to bring re more reason and sanity to the situation that developed there. And I don't know, I read it and it, it was like, oh yeah, that, that could have been me. Whether it was, I'm not going to claim it, but it could have been. Um, but because I helped start the French Revolution, and I think even I think she actually even said, then later was horrified by the direction that that movement actually took of all the people being executed and everything. That that now that I have a higher truth, I feel compelled to try to teach people something that's more going to be more helpful to them than what I persuaded them to in the past. Self-evident, isn't it? It's a karmic debt that I owe. I had this, I was given the gift of articulation and I used it for a cause that was not noble, that was not sufficiently noble for, for, it, for me to, 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 for it to really be dharma, for it really to, have, to bring me to self-realization. And now I have to pay that back. It's just a karmic debt. I used it incorrectly. I was sincere, but nonetheless I was wrong. And therefore it has to be balanced. Everything has to come back. Everything has to come back to a zero. Can't see it. What do you? What about good karma? The question my uh, friend in the room asked me: What about good karma instead of just bad karma, karmic debt in terms of good karma? Well, you. It can also be that you have really, really wanted something, and you've reached the point where you you are now allowed to have it. So the you know, it's 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 a debt because you've worked hard to to earn this, you know, to earn this. I know um, uh, uh, some people like. There's a man that I, I I've known well, and he just had such good luck and such good intuition in business. He made a great deal of money. He just always seemed to know what the right decision was. He always seemed to know when to enter into a flow of energy. He always seemed to know exactly when to get out of it. He had a beautiful family, he had a lovely home, he had a wonderful wife. And Swamiji specifically commented on him. He said, people look at that man and they think, oh, how lucky he is. And then he, he said, but they don't see how many lifetimes he worked to get an incarnation like this one in which everything flows. So what he has done is he, had, he has paid back a lot of his karmic debts. He's settled his debts. And because he settled his debts, now the energy can flow in a very positive way. And that man, to his credit, he, 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 um, he supported Swamiji, and he supported the publication of Swamiji's books especially. Um, now that the, the universe, everything had balanced, and now he was able to be intuitive and to manifest in a very positive way, he kept giving back. And he kept giving back on a very high level. Actually, he was, I believe he was personally responsible for the financial side of publishing the first edition of Autobiography of a Yogi back in 1993 when we published it. He took it upon himself um, to pay for that publication. He also paid, I believe, for Swamiji to publish The Essence of Self-Realization. So it wasn't the, that book. So it wasn't only, and I think perhaps even others, it wasn't only that he had balanced the scale and was now behaving in such a way that um, the universe owed him rather than he owed the universe, um, but he also was acting in such a way as to perpetuate that good karma. Because when much is given to us, if we take it to the ego and use it for ego aggrandizement, then we set the aberration up again. But if we take what is given to us and use it to, to stand in the truth of our divine self, then we, we don't create more debts for ourselves because we operate properly. And that's why yogis become extremely conscientious about what they say and what they do speak the truth, follow through on your word, 
and all the other things, you know, meditate, be generous, support a divine work. I, I've been in a very unusual situation. Well, not that unusual, but very interesting to me. My family was not wealthy. We were, we were comfortable, middle class comfortable. In the last years of my father's life, he, he, um, he was an actuary. And he just hit upon a way of uh, having a, a private consulting business that actually turned out to be quite lucrative for him. And he converted what used to be my bedroom in the family home into his office so he had no overhead. And he found a niche for himself where he was very talented and very effective. And he, and he was also, my father was a very hardworking man. And he worked, I mean, at least through his late 70s, maybe even into his 80s. And he, he liked his work and he just kept doing it. So when he, when my mother died and then when he died, there was a, a, a very pleasant inheritance for us. Not generational wealth by any mean, but a, a nice sum of money, which I was very grateful to receive. And I used it, <laughs> I used a lot of it when Swamiji was still living. It came at a very, very useful time about 20 years ago. Um, when Swamiji was still living, and it just became my Kriyananda travel fund. And it was just like a separate over here money that wherever he was in the world, whenever he, he would welcome a visit, whenever he wanted to vacation or travel, I just used that money. So I never had to think about it. And on a minute's notice, I could just pick up my passport and buy a ticket and go. And it, I was really grateful. Swami's life kept extending and <laughs> trips became more frequent and I didn't know which was going to run out first. <laughs> but Swami's life ran out before the travel fund ran out. Then it became, well actually even before that, um, when Swamiji was developing the work in India, I was able to give Swami a you know, solid amount of money of my father's money. When I wrote, started writing books, um, I was able to publish those books and donate them, given them to Crystal Clarity because of my father's money. I mean, I didn't do anything with it. I never earned a penny of that. But it was there and it was held. I've held it to serve Master's work. I have no, that, that's my life. I can't, find, I can't separate serving Master's work from my life, so it's just the same thing. But this wonderful thought occurred to me, and it only occurred to me fairly recently, that my father worked hard for that money. That money is energy, and that energy has gone to build Master's work, to help Swamiji personally, um, to, to publish the books that I've written, to help Swamiji with several of the projects that he wanted to do, including the television shows that he did in India. My father gets that karma because he was the one, and I watched him work. He worked hard for years to make that money happen, and my mother was very frugal and also contributed um, in, in managing it. She managed it, he earned it. And, and, but that goes right back to them, just right back. This is among many ways that um, it's very good karma to have someone in your family on the spiritual path. One of the things that Swamiji told us when we were, especially when we were much younger, in the early years of Ananda, and our parents, those who were Christian, I was very happy I was Jewish in that context, the Christian families expected the young people to come home at Christmas. And Swamiji was creating this very dynamic and spiritually profound Christmas with the all-day meditation on the 23rd and Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and it was very deep. And Swami said, don't go to your parents' house Christmas. He said, it's just, you know, it, it's going to be just a worldly holiday. You should stay here. He said, go at New Year's and go at Thanksgiving, but don't go at Christmas. And uh, he added to that, your parents may, their egos may rebel, but it's very, very, very good karma for them if you advance spiritually. And I, I know that. I I cannot quantify it. I could not possibly tell you how I know. But my parents and my whole family have been deeply blessed by the life that I've lived. And I, I, I say that it's not like the life that I've lived. It's just I've watched the divine law operate. And 
as I said, I could not quantify that. I can't, I can't tell you a word of why I know that's true. But I absolutely know it's true. It just is. But then even that, you know, the energy, the, the resources that came into my hands that are going forward there, it, and it's paying off karmic debts because all that energy has now gone into um, self-realization. And interestingly, um, Anandi, one of the founding members of Ananda, after she'd been in Ananda for a number of years, found out something she hadn't known. She, she, her family was from St. Louis, Missouri. And, and, the, and she found out that her father, not her father, excuse me, her uncle, her uncle had known Master. Because Master came through, the timing was such, that Master traveled and lectured in the city of St. Louis. He traveled in most of the major American cities, and St. Louis was one of them. And Anandi's uncle became involved with Paramahansa Yogananda. And she found, someone in the family found, a personal letter to her uncle from Paramahansa Yogananda signed. And it was, it was just great fun for all of us, as you can well imagine. And one of the things that was in the letter was Master was urging her uncle to financially support the SRF Center, the fledgling SRF Center that was starting in St. Louis. And Master said, if you stand by the center financially, you will receive um, realization for that. And Swami was so intrigued because Master says, if you give money, you will, your God realization will increase. He didn't say that you would be liberated, but that your realization will increase merely by giving your money. And it was Swami hadn't really, at least he, he acted as if he hadn't really put that part together. But you know, what we do with our money, uh, we, we can talk a good story, and we can talk a, a big, you know, lots of things, but what you actually do with your money is a very interesting indicator of what you really believe is true. And you can just watch yourself, ask yourself, you know, look at your credit card bill. Like, where does my money actually go? And how much of the money that is that I'm graced with, that I'm given the privilege of earning or inheriting, as happened in my case, how much of it do I use for self and how much of it do I use for God? I mean, this is the way literally karmic debts get, uh, get uh, accumulate also. You know, we're given great resources and there's great spiritual need around us, but we prefer to, to keep, to hoard for ourselves when the opportunity is there. Be practical in your idealism, but that's why, that's why tithing is such a, a tremendously powerful um, spiritual tool. The, the, the formality of tithing is this. Tithe means, means 10%. Tithing uh, started with Moses, actually. It's often associated with Jesus, but Jesus was merely continuing what was already in the Mosaic Law. You have to go back into the Bible to sort that out, but it's all there. Um, it didn't come down as one of the Ten Commandments, but it was still in, at the time of Moses is when it started. And it was, uh, you have ten sheep, and you, know, you keep nine, and you give one of them to the temple. You have ten sheaves of wheat, you keep nine, and you give one of them to the temple. And in this way, the um, spiritual dimension of society is supported um, by the working members of society. And then those who take care of the spiritual welfare of society are able to devote themselves entirely to that rather than constantly having to divert their energies into something else. It's a beautiful, balanced reality. And as tithing has come down with a tenth being where the word comes from, it's that a tenth part of whatever I receive, I give back to God. Now, usually God is not sitting there and he doesn't really need money anyway. So in practice, what that means is I return one-tenth to the source of my spiritual inspiration, whatever that might be. Uh, when Swamiji was living, many people tithed directly to Swamiji. They, they loved Ananda, perhaps, 
but, but the real source of their inspiration was Swami Kriyananda, so their tithe went directly to him. Others felt it was tithing to Swami to support Ananda because he had dedicated himself to building Ananda, so one de gave a tenth part to Ananda itself. And, I mean, some people tithe to the Sierra Club or to the Humane Society or just where you feel inspired, where you draw inspiration, you're the source of your inspiration, you, you tithe to that. I mean, the highest source. So it's not like you tithe to the local, you know, uh, soccer team or something like that. You try to find something on, on the highest level. And it's just a percentage. So if you earn $10, then you give $1. If you earn $10,000, then you give a thousand dollars. Friends of mine said they started tithing, and the first tithing they check check they wrote was for fifty dollars. And then at the time, my friend mentioned this to me, and the most recent one had been for a million. And there there was a lot that happened in between, but it was the same percentage all the way through. You know, just that's the balance point. Now, if you if ten percent scares you, you can lower the number. But the percentage is what counts. Because if you ask yourself, can I afford to do this? Then all of a sudden it gets very mixed up in your mind. But you, what you're saying is that it's God's grace that I have resources at all. And I, I, I paid my commission, my commission for being alive. And I offer it back. I can... Again, I don't have stories. I can't tell you, you know, this has happened and that happened. But I know, I just know with every part of me that there's tremendous power in this. And some man who was a prosperity guru and believed very strongly in tithing, he said, uh, if you're not a little nervous, you need to be tithing a little more. <laughs> he said, you have to be pushing yourself. Now, I'm not going to advocate that, but it was... He was saying, this is an act of faith. And see, what's fun about tithing is if you only have $10 and you have to give away a dollar, you know, that, that seems like a lot. But if you have $10,000 and you have to give away $1,000, that seems like a lot. So everybody gets to play out there, what do I really believe? What is, where does my security come from? What, how, how is it possible for me to have a job in which I can earn money, in which I can support myself? Where does it come from? You know, what is real? And anything that allows you to practice, you know, I don't, I don't feel that money is outside of the spiritual world. It's the most dynamic um, uh, personification of energy. And it's an extraordinarily interesting uh, fruit of our labors and just meaning not only just literally your paycheck but your magnetism and your energy and I, it's just a very interesting subject to me and I don't think it's I don't think it's unspiritual I think it's right in the middle of everything especially because people will come and say oh I'm, you know I want to love God I want this I want that I say well why don't you tithe oh well I can't afford to tithe oh okay <laughs> You know, we have to figure it out. We have to come, we have to find the courage to really do it. Okay, and all of that was diligently following his chosen path and cleansing himself thereby of all sin, his karmic debts. The yogi, after many births, attains perfection. And so there you are. What Swamiji then writes about this from what Master said about breath. And, and there's a very interesting just sort of the inhalation and exhalation. Because once we start, which is what we're, we're working with here, you know, to actually directly affect the inner consciousness and work directly with the energy inside of us, which is what the previous one, previous verse was about, um, the breath always figures at the center of whatever we're doing. The breath, all serious efforts to influence our inner consciousness um, sooner or later come back to the breath. It's, it's the life force. It's the definition of life itself. And the, the, the fascinating and wonderful thing about the breath 
is that it's between a conscious and an unconscious action. We can all influence our breath. We can stop breathing for a period of time. We can hold our breath. We can breathe much faster. We can slow the breath down. We can do measured breathing. But you can't commit suicide by simply stopping to breathe. You can't stop your own breath. Now, you can by yoga, but you can't stop your own breath just by willpower. If you hold your breath, which if you have the willpower to hold your breath strong enough, long enough, what will happen is you will black out. And as soon as you black out, your, your breathing will resume of its own because the body will want to save itself. And so you will start breathing again. And the wonderful pattern of, of breath, when a baby is born, um, the astrological moment of its birth is not when it emerges from the womb. It's when it takes its first breath, which usually is almost immediately because that's what happens. The baby is outside the womb suddenly and it's no longer being oxygenated by the, the mother, the, the mother's processes. The child inhales. Incarnation begins when you inhale. And Baxter says that one of the reasons that most babies cry is because when they take that breath, they realize they have engaged again with the material plane. They are incarnated in a physical body and the whole story is starting over again. And Master says that that wail is not because of the air rushing into their lungs. It's because of the realization of what that means. Here we go again. One of my friends who was a, a very serious meditator, a serious yogi, he uh, had two uh, sons. They were born uh, They were born a couple of years apart, but he was... He had two babies, basically. And uh, he said reincarnation, he knew about reincarnation, but the implications of it did not really sink in until he was raising babies. And he saw how helpless they were and how undignified their life was and how just utterly dependent they were on everyone and how what a long time it was going to be before they even had the slightest bit of control over their own lives. And he said, most many new parents, the excitement and the demands of parenting cause them to become less regular in their meditation. My friend told me, from the day his son was born, he never missed meditation after that <laughs> because it was so vivid to him. Oh my gosh, I don't want to go there again. Okay. So you inhale and it starts, and then if you've ever done a death vigil, there's just the moment when the breath goes out and does not go in again. And it's so exceedingly dramatic. I mean, whether or not it goes out in a dramatic death rattle, my father died with a, a wonderfully sort of, uh, just a wonderful death rattle. It just, it, it just went out, and you really heard it go out. I've been with others who have died, and you, you don't really hear it, but you suddenly realize. I mean, it's very soft, but you suddenly realize the breath has gone out. And you listen and you wait, and it never comes in again. It's such a, a beautiful story. Many people say that your breaths are counted, meaning you have exact, you have so many. And when, you, when the last one is exhaled, that's when your body ends, when your body's done and your soul goes on. This is uh, interesting because people who are very calm often breathe more slowly than people who are very agitated. So if stress actually shortens your life, if you want to say that you just use up your allotted breaths much sooner, it's, it's, I think that's more romantic, but it's sort of fun to talk about. But, but what... Um, Master mentions here in the commentary is that we think of each lifetime and the space in between as all being separate events. But it's not. You just exhale, you leave your physical body, you go into the astral world, you have your sojourn in the astral world, and you are, as you are, those who are able to be 
who are more aware of subtle realities are, are more awake in the astral world. Individuals whose entire consciousness is physical, who when they lived in this world, everything was defined by the material world, everything was defined by the experiences of the body. Master said they, they, they can't really wake up in the astral world because they, they just it's, the vibrations are too subtle, they can't see them, they can't experience them, and they don't really wake up. He said it's, they rest, Master called it as sort of a gray dream, that they're not unconscious, but they're not really very conscious either. People who have meditated, people who have tried to live well, people who have refined tastes and an appreciation for beauty, I mean, above the animalistic level at all, you go into an astral world that's very pleasant, that, that is reflective of your consciousness. But you don't breathe physically because you have no physical body. Energy flows in a very different way. And then you reincarnate, you come into a womb, you come out of the womb, and you inhale for the last, to balance the last exhalation. And you inhale, and then you start all over again, and then you finish with an exhalation. And that's how it runs. Now, what's written so beautifully in the commentary here is that if you meditate deeply, um, the breath will, can also stop because the life force withdraws so far from the physical body that the physical body pauses. You, it just it pauses in that endless um, in and out exhalation, and and it it can create then because the breath keeps us very restless. That's why we work with the breath using the breath to calm ourselves down because especially the breath just keeps us keeps pumping everything keeps moving and pumping so when a yogi goes breathless but but he's not going to die and the body just pauses so then the yogi has exhaled and the breath doesn't come back but then when the yogi comes out the yogi inhales again so Lahiri Mahashaya is describing each one of those cycles is like a little death because the exhalation has happened, the inhalation has not returned. When one practices the Hong Sa technique, which is the, one of the beginning meditation techniques for the practice of Kriya, one observes the breath without influencing it. But in merely observing it, the, the bodily systems and the concentration the breath will gradually slow itself down and even pause. If not for a long period of time, it will, it will become so still that there will be an exhalation and there will be a pause before the inhalation. But if the, if the body actually goes breathless, as Lahiri is saying, it's, it's a little death. And so it, it gives a very interesting esoteric explanation of what St. Paul says in the Bible. He says, by the grace of Jesus Christ, I die daily, he says. So, you know, when you think of Kriya, when you think of yoga practice. Now, Master said that Jesus taught his disciples Kriya Yoga or something very similar to it because they didn't call themselves yogis and Christians don't, fundam you know, uh, institutional Christians don't like um, us attributing to, to Jesus things that they don't attribute to him. But Jesus taught his disciples how to, how to um, find the kingdom of heaven, which he said the kingdom of heaven is within. He, he, and he taught his disciples how to change their consciousness. That was the whole point, wasn't it? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. These outward rituals, that was Jesus's entire message was that these outward rituals, which by that point were hundreds of individual laws, all enforced on the Jewish people by um, a corrupt priesthood who was, you know, enjoying its wealth and power by being the authority for whether or not you were conforming with all of these laws. But it was just outward ritual. It's just what the Bhagavad Gita said. But Jesus came 
and talked to them about their inner state of consciousness. And he talked about the kingdom of God is within you. And when he was criticized for healing a man on the Sabbath, and you're not supposed to work on the, ha on the Sabbath, but yet this man needed to be healed, and Jesus healed him. And then the priest tried to say that he'd broken their laws and therefore was displeasing God because he'd healed the man on the Sabbath day. It was preposterous when you think of it from the point of view of inner consciousness. And so that was when Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, meaning these outer rules and rituals were to help us direct our consciousness. But they, the, not man for the Sabbath, man's goodness is not defined by whether he follows these rules. These rules are there to help us change our consciousness. You know, true inner communion is what he was teaching. So Jesus, uh, St. Paul saying, I die daily, which doesn't make any sense unless you understand the principles of yoga. And then all of a sudden, oh, I see what he's talking about. Once you read the Bible with an understanding of self-realization, the original teachings of Jesus begin to emerge in a very different way. We're, what we're working now is the original teachings of Krishna, but Swamiji also wrote a book called Revelation of Christ, which is a fundamental review. It's not a verse-by-verse -verse commentary, but it's a fundamental review of the teachings of Jesus. There is a verse-by-verse -verse commentary that Master wrote that was published by Self-Realization Fellowship. Um, I, f I find their books harder to understand than what Swamiji writes, but nonetheless, uh, Swamiji doesn't have an equivalent of that one. So it's a, it's a, for those who are serious scholars of the Bible, it's well worth reading. Okay. So the other part is the yogi after many births attains perfection and enters at last into the supreme beatitude. Swamiji wants to make it clear to us, and it is a very important point. As he puts it, he said, God realization is not an endless trek across a featureless desert and the final arriving at, a, at an oasis, meaning everything is terrible and then suddenly everything is good. He says it's a, it's a gradual expansion of consciousness, the way Swamiji put it. it, it and so the desert begins to bloom around you. So you're walking out of the wilderness, you're walking out of the desert um, as soon as you begin. Because as soon as you begin to understand you know, what the purpose of life is and have even the slightest capacity to begin to follow these teachings, everything begins to change. You know, it was, well, it was self-realization itself that I discovered first through a different a different line of teachers, Ramakrishna and Vivekananda, but it was exactly the same teaching. And then Swamiji himself. But when I just the just the transformation of understanding that there was a way of looking at life that actually made sense. And and that there were individuals in the world who were not only intelligent, but they were actually wise. And that was the, um, the distinction that I gradually came to understand. I was raised intellectually, and I valued, you know, intellectual knowledge and intelligence itself was tremendous value in my family. One of the, I, I, I had this experience in my life where Swamiji sort of, uh, awakened within me an intuitive ability to cook. And I've always wondered why he was able to awaken that in me over the course of a weekend, where it took about 25 years for <laughs> him to get me to the point where I could write a book. And one of the reasons I realized was because I of my upbringing, cooking was not important. And, and I didn't have any... Um, I just didn't have any self-worth tied up in whether or not I could cook. It turned out to be a, a very useful skill that I've, I've enjoyed having all these years at Ananda, and it's brought me many opportunities that have been really fun. 
But I didn't need to be a good cook in order to be a worthwhile person, whereas writing, as an, as an alternate example, was so much at the core of everything I valued that there was all these conflicting cross-currents of ego. You know, that it was it just, it was easy for him to awaken one thing because it, it was not meaningful to me. Oh, so what I was saying was, uh, the difference between intel knowledge and wisdom uh, was always very vivid to me. And I realized that intelligence is not, I mean, w wisdom brings great understanding, but it doesn't necessarily make you intellectual. That's the word I want to use. There's a difference also between being intelligent and being intellectual. And intellectual was the value that I was especially raised with. Um, because the more one understands of life, the more intelligently one can respond to everything, the more brilliantly we can relate to each other, the more we can understand circumstances, we can be intuitive, we can do all of those things if we are fundamentally in tune with, with the nature of life. So what Swami wanted us to understand is that every, this is what I was saying, once... I was aware of the fact that life had meaning and that meaning was dynamic and that meaning was also well understood by a vast number of people, just not the people that I had met up until that point, and that there was a method. There was just a, there was a method. That alone was the beginning of the flowering of the desert. I didn't even actually have to do anything yet. It was just the knowledge that there was a path and I could follow it. And I, I have to say, absolutely, all these years, many things have happened that were not easy or effortless to get through. But one of the ways the desert blooms around us is that we, we understand. Viktor Frankl, who was a, uh, he survived. Um, he was uh, uh, five years, I think, in one of the Nazi concentration camps. And he was a psychiatrist already when he was arrested. And after he was released, he had a long and very fruitful career as a psychiatrist. And he developed a, a, a form of psychotherapy, which essentially became the search for meaning. And living in the ho horrible circumstances that he was compelled to live in, during the Second World War, because he was Jewish, and 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 Vien, uh, Austrian, he was an Austrian Jew. Um, he perceived how differently people experience the same terrible circumstances, and what he gradually learned from observing himself and others was that if there was meaning in the suffering. He said people's capacity to endure was completely different. And when people lost any sense that there was any meaningful reason to continue, he said that meaning could be the belief that, you know, they needed to survive for their children or for their wife or, or for the sake of the Jewish people or whatever it might be. It would, it would give them power. But when they lost uh, any any meaning behind their suffering. He said the suffering became unendurable. And he was able, he would see it happen. He would see it happen to people. And he said very quickly they would fade and then they would die. But when he, he came out of those awful circumstances, he was able to help people ask deeper and deeper questions about what they were going through. And most notably, and many of you have heard me say this before, but it's so powerful. There was a man who came to him because he'd been married for many years, decades, and his wife had died. And after his wife died, he just fell into a depression he couldn't come out of. So some of his friends insisted he come and see Dr. Frankel. And Dr. Frankel began by talking to him about his wife. And the man, you know, talked with such love and affection for this wonderful woman he'd been married to. And gradually, Dr. Frankel brought the conversation around, and he said, um, what would have happened t to her if you had died first and she had um, 
survived you. He said, oh, it would have been very difficult. He said, I, I took care of everything for her. It was my joy to make her life, you know, elegant and easy. But without me, I don't know how she would have coped. And then Dr. Frankel said, ah, then, he said, you've spared her that suffering. Just like that. And this man who had been, you know, so depressed and dejected, all of a sudden he realized that he'd given his wife a great gift and how wonderful it was that she had died before him and that he was left to live on alone because now she didn't have to do that. And the way Dr. Frankel tells the story, he said, the man was silent for some minutes and he watched him understand. He stood up, he reached out, he shook the doctor's hand, he walked out and he never came back. But you can see how that is. If you have an understanding, even if your experience is still just the same, everything is different. I mean, that's the karmic debt, if you want to think about it. You know, once I grasped karma and reincarnation and the path of self-realization, by no means has, have things been easy. But there is a world of difference, there's a universe, there's an infinity of difference between understanding that this is how I must go because I am heading somewhere, I am balancing, and at the end of this, everything will resolve in bliss. And the desert blooms around us. God bless you, my friend.